This is Freedom Investor Radio, and I'm John Pearl. It hit me like a freight train when I realized there was a better way. When I discovered that I could take my future into my own hands. When I realized I could invest my way to freedom. This is what I'm working towards. In each episode of Freedom Investor Radio, we will explore the tactics and strategies used by the top real estate investors and entrepreneurs in the nation. We will learn how you can start investing your way to freedom and take control of your life. Thanks so much for tuning in. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Freedom Investor Radio. I'm your host, John Pearl, and today I am joined by Alex Olson of Exchange CRE. Alex, welcome to the show today. Hey, thanks, man. Happy to be on. Absolutely. So today we are going to be talking about 1031 exchanges. And for those of you who have never heard of a 1031 exchange, it is a way to avoid capital gains tax on an investment property. So you, if you have an investment property, you can sell it and and buy a new property that, uh, of higher value and avoid the capital gains taxes. So I'm going to let the expert take over. Alex, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you're doing now, and how you got there? Yeah, so uh, the basic story is I was in consumer finance for about 15 years doing marketing. So I learned a ton about business, always been an entrepreneur, really wanted to get into real estate actually after I built my dream home with my, my wife and I. And even though it's like the small details, but it's like, hey, look, here's how you can you know, learn about financing, construction loan, details of, of why a, a home's worth more or less than it, than it can be. All those kind of details. I was like, man, I love this stuff. I think I've got a good knack for investing in this. So let's go ahead and take a home equity line of credit on the property and buy some property. So before I got my real estate license, I bought uh, some investment properties around town. And um, through that process, I, I met a mentor because I was trying to buy his property. Uh, I'm known kind of as a persistence guy. I'm always calling people and bugging them uh, about trying to, trying to <laughs> buy their property. So anyway, he's like, man, you need to go out and get your license because, you know, you just don't stop. And so I did. And then I actually met Logan, uh, Logan Freeman here. And we started Exchange CRE. A um, couple of years later, after we both had been at some other brokerage firms, and the reason why we got into this was exactly what you talked about at the beginning of the show, which is 1031 exchange buyers and the advantage uh, uh, that the 1031 exchange affords those buyers. So that was that's kind of my journey of how I got into where I'm at now with the commercial real estate side of the world. Excellent. So let's get right into it. For those who don't know what a 1031 exchange is or how it works. Can you kind of give us a, an idea, an overview of who it would apply to, when they should do it, what the process looks like? Yeah, yeah. So uh, 1031 exchange is actually a federal tax uh, code. It's part of the IRS. So federal doesn't matter what state you're in. And what it allows you to do is allows you to sell any real estate investment property. So you have to own the property, sell that, and you can defer your capital gains on that until another time by buying another investment property of any type in any state. So you can come in and out of any state. It could be any type of property. It could be land. It could be a hotel. It could be multifamily that you're selling and or buying, right? Um, and it allows you, yeah, to defer all your taxes until another time. And the reason why that is a great tool. There's a lot of great reasons for it. But my favorite example is to let's say you have a million dollar duplex or fourplex that you have. You've owned it for, well, it doesn't really matter how long you've owned it, but five years, let's say. You've, it's appreciated in value. And you want to lever up, meaning you want to get a lot more units or a lot more wealth built. And so you sell that million dollar property and then you go ahead and buy a much bigger property using all those pro proceeds, paying no taxes on it at that time, into like, let's say, a Midwest market like Kansas City. And now you take your million dollar property. Now you have, let's say, a $2 million property with 20 units. You're cash flowing more. Your basis in that property 
uh, is at a good leverage point and your depreciation restarts on that. So all the tax benefits that you had on your other property is just magnified and you really didn't do anything different. You didn't, you didn't have to spend any more money uh, because you're using all of that equity you have in your old property. And now you've got, you know, 20 units and more cash flow and all the other things I already mentioned. So it's a great tool, my favorite tool for leveraging uh, and levering up on your investment. Got it. So let's say, is there a, a point in, in the amount of equity you have in your property where it starts to make sense? Say, for example, I've got a, I've inherited a mountain house in the, out here in California. It's got 250K of equity in it, and I don't want to deal with it. So I decide to sell it. It's been an investment property, so there would be capital gains taxes. When does it start to make sense? Is, is 250, 250K a, a reasonable point, or is it, is it less than that where it makes sense, or does it need to be like a million dollars in that you're, you know, that you have in equity? Yeah, and that's a, a good question, but it's really up to you in what you like to do. Of course, the where we're at here in the Midwest in Kansas City and what our uh, clients are typically looking for and what we have access to from a multifamily side, you know, a million to $5 million is a good spot because anybody can buy a duplex, a fourplex in Kansas City, you know, let's call it 200 to 500,000 bucks. So there's a ton of competition for those smaller properties. So in your example, the $250,000 in equity is still a good spot because here in Kansas City, you can leverage 75%. So you can put that 250 down and buy a million dollar property um, you know, with a local lender here at call it 5%, maybe five and a half percent interest rate. And uh, that's a good start, you know, and, and so you can go up from there. We have a lot of people that have a million bucks in equity. And so they're out here buying $4 million uh, worth of stuff. We've got a, a 41 unit, for example, apartment complex. That, so that's exactly what someone's trying to do is take their, their they sold a $2 million property, had a million dollars in equity. And now they're trying to leverage up to buy this $4 million property. Got it. Now say, just uh, just thinking of different scenarios here, is are you able to do it in, say, somebody, maybe they're not interested in doing the work. In the example I just mentioned, say somebody has, uh, you know, they're, they're not interested in managing a property or even being involved with owning investment real estate, but they do like the benefits of the benefits that come with owning real estate. So is there the potential through a 1031 to joint venture with other folks or invest passively like in a, in an syndication or something like that? Is that an option? Yeah. So the, the best option for that is to find, well, you're, what you're doing is you're setting up a tenancy in common. So you technically can't invest as a passive investor syndicator because what you have to do is you have to take and maintain that ownership of what you sold and even using the same entity to buy the new property. But how you can do that in more of a syndication style model is through what's called a tenancy in common. And certain syndicators have those on occasion. Um, for example, you know, here in town, there's several syndicators, you know, FTW Investments, they have on occasion and really as a need basis, uh, 1031, or sorry, a, a tick type of structure that's perfect for 1031 exchanges because you can take your million dollars in equity that you have as part of your entity and combine that with maybe four or five other uh, 1031 partners that are also ticking into a 10 or $12 million structure. And you're completely passive, you know, where the, the management company and the, you know, the, it's not a syndicator, but the, the, the business owner and manager of that group has all the control, has all of the, makes all the business decisions. And you're there as an investor that's more passive, obviously, than you would be if you owned it and had somebody else managing it. Got it. So let's talk about the process of initiating a 1031 exchange. From my understanding of it, it's not something where you can just say, oh, I've sold an investment property. I've got these funds and now I have to place them within, is it 90 days? For, you have to, uh, so that's a good question. So it's 45 days from the moment you sell, you have, you can identify up to three properties. From the moment you sell, you have six months to close out one, two, or three of those properties. 
Uh, and so those are hard and fast. Doesn't matter if that falls on Christmas day, doesn't matter if you're in the hospital, any of those kind of things, it's calendar days um, that you gotta be very careful with. And, and to elaborate a little bit more, you must sell your property and have a qualified intermediary hold all of your funds. Uh, you actually can't touch them. So if you've already closed out your, your property and you're like, Hey, yeah, I've got these funds in my account and I want to, you know, defer taxes by exchanging, you're too late. You have to have the qualified intermediary handle your funds in advance uh, before they get to your, your bank account. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's, it's a done deal at that point. Um, and, and so you got to be very careful of who you're working with and how you're doing it. And those dates are hard and fast. Your qualified intermediary is going to hopefully be on you and let you know what days uh, you know, your identification period really is and, and really be strict with you and, and help guide you through at least the identification period. Great, great info. So all you folks out there, I know a few of you who will be listening to this are thinking about doing the 1031 exchange. So take notes. And so you mentioned the qualified intermediary, which you are. So you can't just go to anybody and you know, say, Hey, I got this property. I got this money. I want a 1031 exchange so that somebody like you has to be contacted and on the team prior to the sale of the property, you have to take hold of the funds and uh, then you control where the money goes alongside of that person who's performing the 1031 exchange. So what about, what about some other hey, pieces? I, wanna, uh, yeah, I go. just going to say, Hey, so we're actually not a qualified intermediary okay. um, because a qualified intermediary needs to be arm's length, meaning they have no real, you know, impact on what your decisions are in terms of where you're going to buy your property, how you're going to sell your property. So a qualified intermediary is typically a title company or an attorney or a CPA. And there's actually some really good ones out in California that we recommend. And that's where most of our business that we refer to goes to because they allow you to you know, make that last second change on your 45 day window where they're saying, Hey, you know, a, a seller says, Hey, look, I changed my mind. I want to identify this other property. You know, some qualified intermediaries allow you to identify at like 1159 uh, PM on your last day. Uh, so our role as, as exchange CRE, as a real estate broker is we help you identify and close out and buy a replacement property for you that cash flows and meets your criteria that is, um, you know, going to fit within a 1031 exchange type of investment. And, and so that, that's kind of our, you know, traditional real estate commercial brokerage transaction. Um, and that's why we focus on the 1031 exchange buyers is because we understand all the intricacies of, and the stress really of getting, uh, you know, finding and closing out your, your property. Great. So thank you for clarifying that. And so what about, uh, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned a little bit, some timelines. So again, I want to, can you kind of walk us through a full, full process of what it would look like if somebody was going to, uh, looking to go through, perform a 1031 exchange, they reach out to you and you kind of help them piece together all of the teammates and, uh, and then you kind of yep. help them on the, on the back end or on the, the other side of it, finding the property. Can you kind of walk us through that? Yeah. So you're, so, you know, a buyer or sorry, a seller says, Hey, look, I'm going to sell this duplex out here. Um, good idea would be to reach out to you know someone like myself and say, "Hey, look, I want to sell this duplex. I'm thinking of invest reinvesting my 1031 money into another market." Okay, so usually the best time is to come to someone like myself within a week or two of listing your property, just so we're aware of what you're kind of looking at, how much money you have or may have once it closes in your market, maybe it's even in Kansas City or wherever. Um, and then from there, we stay in touch until your property actually is under contract. Once it's under contract, we're still in touch with, you know, this is all your download. We call that your download of the property you're selling. And so then at that point, we're also saying, okay, what are some properties that are gonna fit within your mold? Finally, your property goes through and is past your due diligence period, meaning the money is hard on the buyer side that's buying your property. And then now your property is closing, right? But all through this time, you have a, you have a qualified intermediary that is going to handle your funds. That's key that you've selected. Property closes. 
you have 45 days from that moment to identify those three properties. So during this window, we are working with you to identify a lender that's gonna be able to close out your property asset type. We're going to also help you with property management if you know, that's something that you need if you're not doing a tenancy in common. Um, we're also gonna help you with insurance, local insurance that gets you actually commercial grade rates versus you know, your state farm or something that you know, just isn't made for investment grade property. Of course, attorneys, you know, if you have to set up LLCs and some of those other things, Anything you need here in Kansas City, we are able to help you identify and get you in contact with contractors. You know, if you're doing a value add type of product, which most people are, you know, they're buying that. Um, so we set all that up for you or get you in contact with all of those people well in advance before your property closes and as your property closes. Uh, and then what we're doing during that 45 day window and hopefully before is we have an off market marketplace. I know that sounds a little bit weird at first, but where all the deals that are on our marketplace on our website are direct to seller, we represent you, the buyer in those. Uh, they're not listed. They're not on LoopNet. They're not on MLS. The only way you can access to those is if you're a member of our website, which is obviously free to join. And we have 10, 10 or so deals on there at any given moment. But as a 1031 exchange buyer client, of ours, we're constantly feeding you those deals saying, hey, what do you think about this deal? What do you think about this one? Well, I don't like that submarket. I don't like that uh, you know, style of property. Whatever the case may be, we're in constant feedback with you during this entire period. And hopefully in the middle of this, we're able to find a property for you, get it under contract. We've even already negotiated with the seller based on the inspection report. And now we're past or almost at the end of due diligence by the time your 45 day windows up. So your risk of paying taxes on the property you sold are very low. Um, and, and I'd say probably 65% of the time when we're working with a 1031 exchange client, we have got them past the due diligence period before the 45 day window is up to where you are basically, like I just said before, very low risk of, of anything bad happening. Um, you know, obviously when you want to fly into town and we want to meet up, happy to do that, show you around, do video tours, whatever the case may be, we are the eyes and ears for you here in the market. And the, the only way we really make money is when your deal closes from the seller. So traditional brokerage transactions, seller pays commissions, and uh, everybody moves on and hopefully we do another one, you know, soon kind of scenario. Yeah, what an excellent value proposition in, in a scenario where time is of the essence, kind of a one-stop shop to make sure that this thing goes through in the, the needed time frame. So that's great. And aside from that, even if there was no time frame, I can tell everyone from experience, it's no fun going into a new market and having to, to build out a team <laughs> on your own. So that that's great. Yeah. And I've, he I've heard you mention Kansas City a couple times. I know that's where you're located and where you do business. Now I'm really bullish on Kansas City. I like, I like what's going on there. Can you kind of tell us why for somebody out in California who may not be familiar with it, why it would make sense, why Kansas City, the Midwest, where you're at makes sense to invest uh, given the current environment? Yeah, so the number one thing in my opinion is it's a low barrier to entry. Um, so, you know, any property you have here, let's just talk about multifamily, you know, you can buy and increase rents. There's no rent control. So let's say day one, you buy a property, somebody or everybody's on month to month, in theory or in, in actuality, you can raise rents on every single one of those tenants the next month and there's no penalty and no nothing you have to do other than, you know, peace of mind with getting comfortable with that with the tenants. Um, so that's a, a great feature. It's very, as part of that, you can tell it's very landlord friendly, uh, you know, tenant laws, you know, of course we don't want slumlords or anything in here, but it's, it's landlord friendly no rent control, uh, no real rhyme or reason of different things you have to do for tenants during and after. I mean, there definitely are, but it's not very strict. Then you also have low taxes, low property taxes. 
that is, you know, on one side of the state line is better than the other side of the state line, but one side of the state line is more predictable than the other side. But in general, it's pretty low taxes. And people are kind of shocked when they come in here and they look at their pro forma and they're projecting taxes based on the sale of the property. And I have to kind of walk through them and say, hey, look, it's not necessarily based on the sale of the property and it's not necessarily based on a formula. Uh, it's at the county level. And, it, and trust me when I say taxes will be in general relatively low. So those are a couple of the tenant, uh, tenant and landlord features of the Kansas City market. Then you have, of course, the diverse economy. Uh, you know, we're not a master of anything here, but we have a little bit of everything. We have tech, we have agriculture, we have a lot of healthcare, we have a ton of engineering firms located here. Um, we have, of course, all the service industries and businesses. We have two different states that are all kind of playing nicely together. Um, and it's just a, a good, robust economy that, of course, is growing. You know, we have 2.2 million, maybe 2.4 million people that live here. And, uh, you know, it's the economy is a scale that it keeps growing. And we're pretty progressive. So you're going to have a great tenant, tenant base. Then we also have uh, an amazing rent to income ratio. It's very low, meaning the rent ratio, you know, the rent is low compared to what their income is. So, you know, everybody talks about three times, uh, you know, rent is three times income, monthly income or whatever the case may be there. Well, ours is a lot higher and it's very difficult to not be able to fill that void. So what that means is we can push rents higher than even what they are. And we're seeing, we're seeing really good rent growth. And so there, there's not a lot of risk to tenants not being able to pay their rent, which is another good thing. Uh, construction costs are also relatively low and, and plentiful. You know, we can get in, in, you know, we can get good contractors in there. I mean, just like any other market, there is a struggle at times, but good contractors get in there, do good work, uh, know how to do it. And so from all those different factors is why, and of course I live here, we really like Kansas City. I mean, you can get a, a duplex for as low as 200,000 bucks and, you know, you can get a 10 unit for a million bucks. And so the economies of scale as you grow your team here is also pretty easy, even once you're established and in the market. That's great. And I want to circle back, Alex, you mentioned uh, that you have a, a, an off market marketplace. I forgot to ask what, what kind of properties are those? Are they specific asset classes, price ranges? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, our, our most common, what we put on there is multifamily um, because multifamily is the hottest commodity. Everybody understands it and wants it. And of course, it's also the most plentiful, <laughs> you know, because everybody needs a place to live. So uh, that's what you'll see on our marketplace. And the typical price range that's on there is a million to five million. We do have quite often actually stuff that's a little lower than that and a little higher than that. But that's our sweet spot is million to five million bucks. We have uh, right now, as of today, 10 different opportunities that are, like, like I said, direct to seller on there. And they range anywhere from 10 units up to uh, 40 units, I think, is our largest we have right now. Uh, no, 48 units. So, you know, it's a good mix. And they're all different asset classes. We've got A, or sorry, all different, um, you know, classes. We've got class A, we got some class C in there. Mostly B and C is our, our bread and butter where there's a little bit of value add. Maybe it's not turnkey, but it's near turnkey. So, and the reason why all those are, in there is because when someone is coming into the Kansas City market, we want them to feel comfortable. So we don't want to give them a, a D plus or even a C minus. We want it to be, hey, look, this isn't a cash flow day one. It's 80, 90, 95% occupied, maybe even 100%. Structurally, it's great. It's got a new roof on it. Go in there, put a new paint color scheme into it, maybe upgrade some appliances and counters and push the rents up. So you're not doing a ton of work to it because you don't want to... Uh, have zero cash flow in your first year, or you want to try to, you know, make a good dent in your wealth building activities. And, and it's just an easy way to get in there. I always tell people, you know, we want you to hit a really nice double, maybe a heck of a single, and maybe you'll get lucky and hit a triple, but go for that double. Don't try to hit a home run on your first purchase into Kansas City. Right. And one thing that just popped into my mind regarding the 1031 is it only 
say staying on the the 250,000 amount say you wanted to buy a property that was 1.5 and the 250 is not enough can other funds be combined with that 1031 money for the down payment or is it kind of a separate deal like like say it's my 1031 and i have 250 in cash sitting somewhere else can that be combined for a $500,000 down payment yeah as long as it's your funds like your own funds, you know, you can always bring more money to the table, um, you know, of your own money. And so that's what a lot of people do do that as well. Like you just said 250,000 bucks, but man, this is going to stretch me on that. I, you know, I want to buy this million and a half property deal, but you know, I've got 250,000 bucks that, or, you know, maybe it's private money or family money or whatever the case may be. You can definitely add that, bring that to the table. Great. But it's not, not the case the other way. Like you can't just use 200,000 of that and keep the extra 50,000, right? That's, that's off the table, right? Correct. Yeah. You have to actually, it has to be more. So the, the purchase price of your new property, the up leg has to be more than what you sold the down leg for. So if you sold it for a million bucks, even if you have only 200,000 in, in equity, the next property has to be bought for at least a million dollars in order to defer the capital gains on that. Got it. So just, uh, just to summarize the, uh, you know, your off market marketplace, generally a million to a million plus I'm thinking at the 75% loan to value, somebody with 250 K could make that work if it's, if it's more than that. And, and if you don't know what the loan to value is, that would mean you put 250 K down for the down payment. And then the lending is going to provide the rest at 750 K. So if anybody out there is in that boat, then this sounds like it would be a good option for you. All right, yeah. Alex. So I want to, I want to uh, kind of pivot a little bit. So as mentioned earlier in the pre-show, I work at a nuclear power plant, Diablo Canyon power plant. I ask this question to all of my guests. So my mission is to replace my W-2 income with income from real estate by 2025 due to the fact that the real or the uh, power plant is shutting down. So what would you, what advice would you offer to folks in my boat? Uh, I know. And if you want to talk a little bit about your, you know, I know you had an interesting uh, interesting exit from the W-2 world. So if you want to talk about that a little bit, but what advice would you offer having been through it for folks trying to exit the W-2 world and uh, get into a life of entrepreneurship or investing where they have more control and freedom? That is a great, great question. And it's a great feat to do because you have this safety net of W-2 lifestyle Paycheck comes, you know, I don't know, every two weeks, at least mine always did, and was reliable, never really had to worry about it. I was there for 15 years in my W-2 job, the same company. Um, and so you get used to it. So, yeah, the big risk is, oh, my gosh, how am I going to survive with maybe some income that's not super regular? I mean, it is, you know, with, with the cash flow and stuff, uh, but it sounds risky. So the Best advice, of course, is, you know, build up your savings, all those kind of things, you know, make a budget, all those, you know, smart things that smart people do, but is to, you know, cut that cord, so to speak, take the plunge. And you're already there in your life where you know you can do it. And so if you can accelerate, you know, your mindset around, hey, look, I am going to be just a... Um, you know, self-employed worker, you, you're already there. Um, and, and, and so I don't think there's a whole lot of risk, you know, with, with people like yourself and like myself that uh, you're not going to be successful. I took my W-2 job. I was making, you know, call it 100000 or whatever it was and was partially scared out of my mind, but I was more excited because uh, I actually was, I was fired from my position which was amazing because I already had this backup plan of being a real estate agent, being a broker. So, you know, another thing you should do if you don't already have your license, real estate license, get your real estate license. And at least you can do single family homes or whatever might be exciting to you in your area. Um, but, but anyway, so once that happened, I was, you know, I had to replace hundred thousand dollars in income. Well, it turns out when I was able to turn on the afterburners and work for myself, I can make four times that amount um, and pay you know, less taxes 
because of where I was putting my money. So I think just uh, having a positive attitude, you know, my wife always says with my particular deal, and it sounds like you're going to be the same way. uh, But, you know, she was very scared and didn't think that, you know, we were going to survive. And so, um, you know, just having that cord cut, that lifeline, so to speak, cut was a great advantage for, for me. And I think for anybody that, you know, once you're forced into it, you know, you can do it. Excellent. I get fired up every time I ask this question makes me happy. I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing. So Alex, uh, can you tell us where folks can go if they want to say they're getting ready to do a 1031 or they want to follow you and uh, that, you know, they want to learn more about the 1031 or work with you. Yep. So uh, exchangecre.com is my website uh, where we have, and then the marketplace is right there. There's a link to it. You sign up, that'll actually prompt me to, to schedule a quick call with you. Um, so that, that's my favorite place is going there. Of course, I'm all over LinkedIn. I love interacting with people there uh, regarding whatever market, whatever you're doing. You know, I'm just excited about real estate, real estate development and, you know, economic growth through real estate. So LinkedIn, you can find me, Alex Olson, uh, and then email me. My personal email is alex at exchange CRE and uh, com and uh, look forward to uh to talking with you excellent well alex it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you today and i hope to stay in touch and talk to you again soon so ladies and gentlemen alex olson thanks so much thank you man thank you for listening to freedom investor radio if you like what you heard make sure to rate review subscribe and share with a friend thanks again for listening